Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Bach, um, and I'm honored today, January 26th, to have with me Will Jones, PhD, uh, right from Royal Leamington Spa, or Leamington Spa, uh, England. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet him uh, last week or so in England um, on my peregrination sojourn uh, through the lovely country, and uh, uh, my meeting with uh, Will was one of the highlights. Uh, he is the editor of The Daily Skeptic. Uh, it's a must read. Um, it began as the Lockdown Daily or something like that, and uh, has turned into uh, um, The Daily Skeptic, which I have to say is somewhat eponymous with my own existence. I wake up skip skeptical, I go to sleep skeptical, so I'm a Daily Skeptic myself, and I assume Will is as well. Uh, tell us a little about your journey to The Daily Skeptic and, and who and what you are uh, prior and now. Hi, hi, Randall. Thanks for having me on. Privileged to to be here to uh, to talk about these uh, important things. Uh, so, I, as you said, I'm uh, Dr. Will Jones. Will Jones, PhD. I'm uh, I'm editor of the Daily Skeptic. We began in twenty April twenty twenty as Lockdown Skeptics, a blog set up by journalist, uh, conservative journalist Toby Young, uh, well known for setting up uh, the Free Speech Union, which. Uh, your listeners uh, might just possibly have heard of, uh, which is making some big waves uh, in this country and in the UK um, in, in terms of free speech and pushing back against the, the huge clamping down on free speech and censorship that we've been seeing. Uh, it was set up just before the pandemic, actually, uh, in, in response to because those those concerns were building, but of course has has really come into its own uh, during the during the pandemic. That's the Free Speech Union. Toby Young set up uh, lockdown skeptics. Uh, as a blog uh, when he realized that the whole world had gone insane uh, as uh, during March 2020 and that there needed to be a contrary voice uh, but m so much of the mainstream media uh, and he, he's uh, he's a mainstream journalist he would write in the mainstream uh, media but so much of it was just not open uh, to uh, to skepticism about anything to do with the pandemic and covid um, and lockdowns uh, and and subse subsequently, of course, vaccines, uh, the COVID vaccines, uh, and and so he set that that up, uh, got 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 huge huge traction, especially uh, when he published uh, a seminal uh, a seminal crit criticism of Neil Ferguson's lockdown model, the notorious Imperial College lockdown lockdown model that's predicted uh, huge numbers of deaths in the UK, in the US, uh, around the world uh, from from the first wave of COVID, hugely. Over overstating those those deaths, he published a critique of that uh, by uh, a, an ex Google software engineer that uh, that went viral uh, and really boosted the popularity of the of the site. Uh, that was uh, that was a, that made a major impact way back uh, in the spring of 2020. And lockdown skeptics developed from there. I came on board as a writer in the autumn of uh, of 2020, and uh, and then uh, started working more and more for it. Uh, for the site over the course of 2020, 2021. It was in due course renamed uh, the Daily Skeptic uh, as as the, the lockdowns were gradually uh, released and there was hope that we were going to go back to normal uh, or the so-called new normal if that's uh, if the WF and uh, and people associated with that have their way, and uh, we uh, and we sort of changed the Daily Skeptic, and uh, and I became editor uh, in the, in of the Daily Skeptic in 2022, at the beginning of 2022. So I've been doing that now for two years, and it has and it has flown by. It's all flown by, uh, which uh, must be a sign of having a good time, as they say. Well, I appreciate your work there, and uh, I think you're a, 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 an excellent writer. Uh, how do I know that? Um, when I when I read your work, it just kind of flows by. Uh, you know, it's, 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 I think the sign of a good writer is somebody who's able to uh, transmit the information, but uh, without being too heavy handed. Um, I'm not sure I, I quite qualify that <laughs> in that role myself. I perhaps a little bit dogmatic, um, but you know, your your scope is is quite broad. What what are the? Uh, um, we'll just kind of go over the recent kind of uh, breadth um, and issues that you've been covering. Uh, I, I can post some of them, but uh, what's what's top of mind uh, for the Daily Skeptic in the last, say, month or so? Oh, in the last month, well, we've been uh, so since uh, so so we were focused very initially, of course, on uh, on lockdowns and and all the extreme response there. That's way back, uh, and uh, and then we moved into uh, obviously that continued, uh, but then when the vaccines came out and as the side effects of those and the serious side effects uh, started to emerge, we. Uh, started putting out more 
um, about uh, about the vaccines and worries uh, worries about that. And then as as things as things developed uh, and as we started to go back to more like uh, normal and go back to normal, uh, we also moved into skepticism of other areas, uh, particularly where there's supposed to, where there's a politically driven agenda of a so-called cons scientific consensus. Which doesn't really exist uh, because but the the but the, uh, the dissident and uh, dissenting scientists are suppressed, uh, and so uh, so the major area there, of course, that uh, your listeners have probably picked up on, uh, is is climate uh, climate alarmism. The idea that the uh, that the that, that carbon dioxide is the is the is the is the knob the the control knob for how hot the earth gets uh, that uh, that nothing else uh, really uh, really matters and that it's because humans are burning uh, uh, lots of uh, fossil fuels in particular uh, that uh, that the earth is going to get uh, get get uh, catastrophically hot that's obviously uh, well known climate that's what we can refer to as on the site as climate alarmism and and we counter that we're skeptical about that not skeptical about the fact that the climate is changing uh, but uh, skeptical about what may be behind all those changes and how catastrophic uh, it really is uh, likely to be and also uh, how practical and realistic a lot of the measures are that uh, we're pursuing to uh, to try to address that so we've been doing quite a lot on on climate skepticism uh, since uh, well, really since uh, mid of 2021, and increasingly in 2022, and so that's uh, so the last month uh, that has that's been a major focus. But also, of course, the ongoing uh, COVID stories. Uh, we have, uh, of course, the uh, the vaccines. Uh, as there continue to be revelations about that, that's obviously a major scandal uh, that's been occurring over the last uh, three years, and uh, and we continue to cover that as that slowly, slowly emerges and people slowly slowly begin to accept uh this is more widely that is uh, rather just among the skeptic community they begin to accept that there may actually have been a serious problem and a serious ongoing problem perhaps as well uh so we have uh, so we've been covering a lot of that and and of course uh the pandemic uh the pandemic treaty that what the world health organization uh, and the united nations are up to with this uh, with these attempts uh to change uh, the international arrangements about how we respond and prepare for, for pandemics and particular concerns about whether those those responses are going to undermine uh, national uh, national control and national sovereignty of the <coughs> of pandemic responses uh, we think uh, we think that there's good there's good and strong indications that they that they are going to undermine uh, undermine those things because as a matter of international law the pandemic treaties and the change and in particular the changes to the international health regulations uh will uh will take change it from being a advisory uh, role that the world health organization plays in a pandemic an emergency a self-declared emergency i should add the world health organization uh decides and in particular the uh, the the chief of the World Health Organization has sole uh, decision about whether there is or is not an emergency. And in an emergency, under the changes that are proposed, uh, they will it will they will become obligatory under international law to follow what the uh, what the World Health Organization says uh, in terms of in terms of NPIs, so non pharmaceutical interventions, restrictions in terms of medical interventions, uh, vaccines, etc. Uh, mandates all that kind of thing. Uh, if the World Health Organization were to say you uh, you must do this, uh, then under the matter of international law, the the changes will mean that countries uh, are are required to do that. Now, critics say, ah, yes, but it's only international law. It's uh, there's no there's no way of enforcing it. Uh, there are international there's there's international courts, but they, these things don't really go to court. And even if they did, they can't countries can't be made to do it. So so and so they they argue that these things aren't really undermining national sovereignty. And you'll see that in a number of fact checks. Uh, but really, that's just showing contempt for international law. What's the point in having international law if it's not supposed to be something that people follow? So we uh, so we are we are we're quite concerned we're very concerned that uh that by making these things a matter of international law it obviously increases the moral pressure on countries uh, and the and the political pressure on countries to fall in line uh but also it's anyone who takes international law seriously and let's be honest a lot of whether uh, even if 
we personally may not take international law seriously. A lot of people in um, who run countries and run governments and run uh, and in the what you might call the elite among the elites, global elites, they take it very seriously. Um, and so we would we can imagine that this would have a big impact on how uh, a, uh, on how a pandemic would be responded to, and we we would anticipate seeing the World Health Organization in the driving seat, which in fact is the point, of course, of the changes to put the World Health Organization in the driving seat. Uh, and uh, I'm sure your listeners, I'm, I'm sure your listeners don't need to be uh, to have explained why it would be a problem to have a one person in the world, the chief of their World Health Organization, uh, in solely responsible for determining and dictating what uh, yeah. what, and what countries, especially are especially, to. especially when when the track record, uh, the history um, is 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 less than stellar. You know, I uh, my expertise uh, recently has been in Zika. I think that was a total flop. Um, and if you go back further, we can discuss that later. But you know, clearly their their COVID analysis uh, was off. Um, it was politically driven, um, motivated, and 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 disastrous. And, and as far as the world health, um, you know, if you just kind of leave the term a little bit loose, um, you know, if you think about global health, what determines that? I mean, when I decide whether how I'm feeling on a given day, a lot of it not just my blood pressure or my you know, some kind of physical uh, signs. Um, it's a lot of my outlook. You know, what's on my prospect today? You know, do I have work to do? Do I have a place to go? Can I go outside? You know, mm -hmm. the, the, a lot of what, what um, you know, the World Health Organization perhaps focused on was a safetyistic or safetyism approach, which was, uh, you know, myopic um, and, and, and laser focused on this one aspect of, uh, you know, a viral test. Um, which may or may not be pathognomotic of any particular disease and, you know, in the wrong, um, um, you know, cohort, you know, young people and whatnot showing positive for a COVID test, you know, their lives have to change, have to be locked down, whatnot, whether it's, you know, indicative of their own physical health or not. So they're, they're you know, the, the, and, and then I guess this is I, one of these discourses I apologize for, but, you know, it, there, I think there's a tendency uh, we've seen in the United States, uh, for instance, um, of, of legislators um, kind of acquiescing and shedding their responsibilities to bureau bureaucracies. Um, so there's a, a law here, I'm not gonna get too far into it because it's, it's under the rubric Chevron, the, the oil company, um, which, which has been a, a, a little bit of a wedge issue about how much the bureaucratic state should be doing, making their own laws. They make the, the, the Environmental Protection Agency here, which makes its own laws about rivers and what, and, and then it winds up being, you know, what size toilet you have to have and things you have to do in your house. And the, the legislature is like, oh, that's not us. That's the EPA. And it seems to me that it's a, a very easy way for the legislators not to take responsibility either way. It's like that wasn't me. That was that was, you know, you're, that was somebody else doing it. That's the WHO in this case. We, our hands are tied. And I think it's a, um, uh, a crutch um, to use another health term uh, uh, and, and a, um, a disability, you know of our system uh, to have legislators, you know, kind of take away responsibility. And I'm, I'm just wondering, um, you know, it, it, given that that uh, in the context of England's having voted Brexit in um, and, and then trying repeatedly to have it enacted and, and done poorly um, overall or, or, or um, uh, you know, without full intent and force of perhaps the voters' needs and requirements, you know, do we see this in England? Is England just going to become another EU? Um, I, I interviewed with... Um, uh, Andrew Bridgen uh, about 10, 12 days ago. And, you know, he was talking about kind of the, the actual apparatus, the, the intelligence agencies, all that kind of stuff in the UK being subservient to the EU. Uh, is this just one bit of like, we don't want to govern um, and we kind of wind up with a mushy uniparty um, at, at the helm? Uh, so yeah, it, does, yeah it, does, it does feel like that, doesn't it? There's, you definitely get a sense that governments like to outsource the, the responsibility to to NGOs to uh, to uh, to quangos so to uh, so that's to to these these non these quasi non government organisations and then of course to global bodies like the World Health Organisation so there is that there is that worry that they would uh, that they would want to outsource uh, that the pandemic responsibility to uh, to a World Health Organisation so there's so that that's that's something that's actually something that they would that they would that they would welcome. Uh, and as you as you noted that there is this there's this idea of 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 you know, what is health and the the world health organization this is another concerning aspect of it has this agenda called one health 
mm. uh, which is uh, which basically defines health so broadly that it, it covers every aspect of life because you know anything in a sense can be can be put under health and well-being uh, if you bring well-being under health then everything's about uh, can it could be defined in terms of what makes people feel feel happy or 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 their lives go well so and 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 they have defined it you know you you have and then you have things like climate predictably inevitably uh, climate change coming under this one health uh, agenda so you start to wonder well what might might there be a risk that they might at some point declare a, a climate change health emergency and therefore uh, and the world health organization uh, to, to starts dictating what countries should and shouldn't do it sounds fanciful uh, but it's but if you look at what they're actually proposing their agenda for one one health you can see that it does actually include include those climate uh, those climate aspects and and not just that you know it's it's just it makes their agenda so broad you just think well what what's left to politics if we if they're putting everything under health and then and then having this 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 treaty that makes us uh, subservient to uh, the director general's uh, decisions uh, whenever there's a, cell, a, a an emergency that the that the director general declares and it, it's worth mentioning actually uh, that the uh, that there was the monkeypox uh, uh, so-called emergency you know monkeypox hardly did anything hardly anyone was infected hardly hardly anyone uh, died it was it was it was largely a non-event and yet the world the director general asked his asked his his committee to decide decide whether it should be classified as an emergency now the, the committee actually the majority of them anyway said no we don't think it is a, a, a global emergency so you know there's some there's some wisdom there they didn't all say that but most of them did but and this was really telling the the director general decided uh, that uh, that since it was his decision and he's right that it was that he decided to declare a, 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 a public health emergency of international concern anyway uh, and therefore engage all those uh, all those powers and in the future would engage uh, all the all the powers the and they'd be obligatory as we say under international law so uh, so 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 big worries um, big worries around that absolutely yeah. No, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I covered that somewhat because I wrote an article for Brownstone on uh, Donald McNeil, the um, former uh, chief science writer at the New York Times. It's called The Marvelous Mr. McNeil. And um, and monkeypox filters in because after his uh, uh, defrocking um, at the New York Times for reasons unrelated to pandemics and his declaring that we should go medieval on the coronavirus <laughs> and what what does that mean <laughs> and and maybe we did um uh he became i hate to use this word but but let's try it out uh, a shill for uh, monkey pots and he he took his substack and he's still you know rather influential he's, a, he's an excellent writer um and otherwise a smart guy perhaps taken away by safetyism um but uh he he kind of took up the mantle of monkey pox ism um and I think you know the hidden theme there is that there's a vaccine a potential treatment for monkeypox. So he was he was kind of on this this endless monkeypox uh, scheme, and and previously he had written uh, for um, and about and with uh, I can't remember the, his name, uh, kind of a you know multi millionaire. Uh, not I'm not sure quite billionaire um, who had taken over um, a potential monkeypox vaccine. Um, and that had 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 um, military ties. I have to pull up the article uh, at some point. But to, to, to you know make make it short and sweet, there are certain illnesses that fall into categories of which there might be a vaccine, and those which might not have one. Um, you know, treating you know, so let's say I mentioned earlier, you know, blood pressure, or whatever, uh, doesn't quite yet have a vaccine. Uh, that's not on the forefront. Uh, HIV um, could have, maybe, should have possibly had a vaccine, but we haven't been able to do that because it's kind of an immune system itself. Uh, that, that's kind of on the back burner. Um, I, I, would, I would venture to say that HIV continues uh, to cause much more of a public health threat ever than, than COVID did, certainly more than monkeypox, certainly more than Zika. And that's not much uh, spoken about by the WHO. And I think, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering whether you can comment on this, whether, um, you know, it, we all serve somebody, right? You know, we, don't, we may not serve God, we're serving some God. Uh, is, who is the WHO's God? I, I think that so in, in terms of the who who who's who's the the god of the WHO in a sense that's that's like asking what's whose agenda is it serving, 
um, who what what goal ultimate goals is, is it pursuing, um, which is a really uh, which is a really interesting question. Uh, there's lots of lots of theories about that, okay, uh, of course, and uh, some of them would be would be termed conspiracy theories. But then you know we shouldn't necessarily assume that global uh, global elites aren't conspiring in certain in certain ways. So that's we shouldn't dismiss uh, them simply because it's got some conspiratorial element. Uh, I think. Um, I think profit is a major is a major motive. There's uh, rich people who like to get richer. There's people who who want to who want to get rich off this. There's uh, major companies, pharmaceutical companies, uh, who are always on the lookout uh, for how they can maximise uh, their profits. Um, and I think that that's uh, that that definitely that definitely plays a role. Um, and we've seen that uh, we've seen uh, companies can act extremely ruthlessly uh, when and uh, into when they when they feel they can get away with it uh, in terms of uh, the, the way they make medicines, the way they go about uh, trying to make trying to make medicines uh, and the way they hide and cover up uh, the uh, the harmful effects of those uh, of those medicines and and cover up uh, the lack of efficacy as well. So so there's definitely a profit motive. Um, I think I would say that there is um, that there's 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 quite a there's quite a kind of messianic kind of save the world motive as well going on. I think that some of these people, I think, I, I, I do get criticised for this because people think I'm I'm not cynical enough. Uh, but I do think that a, a lot of these people who are involved, or a number of them, uh, really do uh, think uh, do think that they're trying to save the world, mm -hmm. uh, and they and they think that the, the ends justify the means, and that they are um, and that so that they are trying to these grand agendas of trying to get a vaccine to 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 eradicate certain diseases uh they and so they believe so you've got bill gates for example uh who i'm sure is trying to make money although he's already got a lot but you know some, some money is never a lot of money is never enough for for some people but i think um i do think that he is uh he has got this this idea that with all his money he should try to he should try to make the world a better place and the way the way, the way he's trying to make the world a better place is by curing diseases by finding and funding those medicines um, and vaccines uh, that will do it so there is this and so there is this idea and so of course that ties in very nicely with the with the profits uh, of with the profit motive of the pharmaceutical companies uh, and so you have this uh, you have this 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 big agenda and especially when as you as you noted uh, Randall that there's when there are these diseases that in particular are susceptible or appear to be susceptible to a vaccine solution, then there's there's a lot of interest in those because there's there's this whole global uh, effort and agenda to find and create vaccines. And in particular, before the pandemic, there was this big push to try to use genetic based vaccines, mRNA in particular, uh, and other genetic based uh, vaccines, uh, and to try to use those as a way of producing uh, vaccines on a platform. Uh, this idea of mRNA being a platform that could produce vaccines uh, quickly uh, and and easily, and possibly be able to, because it's the same platform, therefore speed up the process of the of the testing them. Because supposedly they will, if they've tested the platform for safety, then they think that they will have therefore be able to bypass a lot of the the tests for future. Uh, iterations of that of that same platform. So these ideas were all there before the pandemic, very influential ideas. And the pandemic was an absolutely huge golden opportunity for these people, the the vaccine sa savior narrative and the pharmaceutical companies uh, to advance that uh, to get that technology, which has been struggling. They haven't managed to get a single mRNA product uh, approved uh, before the pandemic. Uh, it was really struggling to get through because of safety problems, uh, largely. And uh, and this was a golden huge opportunity that they grabbed with both hands, uh, and the regulators as well who are keen to do it as well uh, uh, to uh, to get this technology uh, to get this technology through, uh, yeah. which is which is what they, which is what they've done, and now they intend to build build on that as we can see, and they're trying to, and they're using the 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 so-called success of the mRNA uh, vaccines uh, to. Uh, to, to really try to push more uh, similar uh, technologies. And we keep reading about that all the time. Yeah, no, I, I think you, you're onto something there. And, you know, my uh, peregrinations through the Zika world, researching my, my book, Overturning Zika, um, I actually began on that book um, before COVID was a thing, before SARS-CoV-2 had uh, uh, become a um, household word. And, uh, you know, COVID and, 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 and pandemic and all that kind of stuff. And, and unfortunately, before, I mean, after the, after the book was published, I, I 
uh, came upon this article, which I think is a little bit of a smoking gun. Let me see if I can put it up for us. Um, but it, it, it brings up, you know, kind of three, four key things together. Um, but Bill and Melinda Gates are, are placing bets on this biotech in the race to develop a Zika vaccine. So I came upon this later when I was researching Zika. And um, I'm going to try to make this a little bit larger for us. Um, uh, Moderna Therapeutics, um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, U.S. Um, you know, human uh, Health and Human Services is going to put $125 million. The Gates Foundation has pledged to give Moderna uh, up to $100 million to develop mRNA-based vaccines for infectious diseases. So this is something before COVID. This is, article is 2017. Um, and it's got, you know, a lot of the, the themes that we, we're talking about here. Um, th there's a, there was a push for mRNA. Now, there didn't, there didn't you know, Zika, Zika as an illness or as a phenomenon, that's not really an illness. Zika is not a human illness. Um, uh, it's a mild, probably monkey um, uh, dengue virus. Um, but, uh, you know, but the, the syndrome of, of Zika supposedly causing microcephaly was caused to do the same thing. Uh, it, it's redolent of the climate thing where no matter what thing they find, whether it's warming, whether, whether you have a lot of snow or no snow, uh, this or that, whatever it happens to be, this always has the same answer. We have to you know, bring more uh, kind of government controlled and, and limit people's lives in one way or another. Um, in this case, whatever the, 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 the you know, virus comes along, the answer is this, this mRNA platform. We have to kind of jumpstart this thing. And I, I speak uh, to you know, an analogy. I happen to currently be a Tesla owner. Um, and I love my Tesla, but I, I don't see it as a, a way of saving the earth because I have, you know, this electric car, because I, I understand that it's really a coal powered car. Uh, but I love the, I love, I love the, the tech aspect of it and, and convenience and all kinds of stuff. But anyway, but, but I think there's an analogy of having to jumpstart an industry. We've seen all the subsidies for electric cars and that winds up, you know, you, you get the thing, but you get it perhaps, you know, you get it definitely in advance of the economic purpose for it. And so you've pushed it really hard and there's all kinds of, um, you know, squeezing through the toothpaste that, that lead to deformities and distortions of the toothpaste tube itself as the aftermath and the economy. So, you know, companies wind up being kind of whipsawed uh, into doing certain things which may or may not be economical. We're seeing this a lot of the fallout from the electric vehicle, um, say, drop in interest once some of the subsidies run out. I think Toyota uh, is going to wind up being fairly successful because they, you know, managed to, you know, uh, blinder themselves to some of the, um, you know, electronic vehicle um, uh, you know, stimuli and, uh, you know, heroin shots, uh, metaphorically speaking. Um, you know, I, I, I wonder, you know, I, I, there, there might be a question in there. Um, I don't know if you want to uh, talk on some of the aspects of the EV analogy um, to, you know, the way these things, these things get externally pushed. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, it's, a, it's a good analogy. Yeah, you've got the, these, these technologies that aren't, that aren't, really, aren't really ready um, and that they've got they've got problems. We keep seeing uh, the I mean, record two hundred percent growth in deaths from uh, electric bike fires in uh, in New York, uh, it was reported this week, uh, and three three electric London buses which spontaneously burst into flames uh, just this month, uh, and in yeah in one city in London. So uh, so this is an indication of of a technology that. Um, you know, it's, it's that's just one of there's, there's a number of issues with the technology. I mean, the technology, as you say, there's some really good things about the technology. Um, the cars they actually produce uh, can be uh, have much, much well, uh, typically much much higher performance than than the, the petrol based and uh, diesel based uh, versions. So you know, I'm not I'm not down on the technology as such, uh, but is it is is it the is it the answer? Is it the solution? Uh, are all is it possible? Is it realistic for all uh, all all tra transport, all cars, all personal cars, all public transport, uh, all logistics to, um, to uh, tr uh, truck uh, trucks and lorries. Uh, is it possible for all of that to go electric? Is that realistic? Also, are there problems with the technology that have been have we've we've blinkered ourselves to uh, because uh, so is it, is it an unripe technology uh, because we're so desperate to push it push it through? It does seem to have an unfortunate propensity to spontaneously burst into flames uh, and uh, and this is increasingly causing uh, causing uh, causing problems injuries deaths so uh, so yeah so we, and so there, there are definite analogies with with the vaccines with the mrna vaccines which 
well, you know, were pushed through in record time. I mean, incredible to get a, a vaccine approved and and being rolled out within you know nine months or something ridiculous, wasn't it? And the, and the aim uh, of the of the, the Gates funded uh, international bodies is a vaccine in a hundred days. That's that's what it's that's their their strap line, a hundred hundred days, which is you know around about three months. All right. And the thing is, I'm not necessarily opposed to mRNA technology. I think down the road, you know, I'm, I'm uh, older than you, I believe, and uh, I'm older than I used to be. I'm older than I frank, frankly was yesterday. And, and I imagine I'm going to continue getting older <laughs> unless something else intervenes. And at some point, you know, if I get my, God forbid, cancer, this and that, uh, if there's an mRNA platform that can kind of somewhat personalize uh, some modality of treatment, blah, 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 I don't think it's necessarily a horrible idea. I don't think that you know, all electric devices are bad. Um, I think they they need to come about in some more of an organic, planned, uh, peer-reviewed, um, understood fashion, um, and 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 not ab abjuring and ignoring and throwing out the the, the current technologies. You know, when, when you talk about the speed with which the mRNA vaccine came out for COVID, uh, I think what people ignore is that Johnson and Johnson and Janssen, uh, almost you know, synonymous. Uh, <clears throat> came out with the adenovirus version of same. You know, that there was a, 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 a regular flu shot variety um, modality, uh, adenovirus carrier platform, whatever you want to call it, old style flu shot version of the COVID vaccine in the same time frame. There, there was no uh, real huge add-on for having the mRNA uh, modality um, for this vaccine. You know, and aside from the fact that it got to be kind of this, in my view, a forced experiment on, you know, billions of people um, and to, just to see what happens. Um, I personally, you know, I, I did not really want to take a vaccine. I held out as long as I could because I didn't think I was in the risk group category. I'm pretty slim and fit and, uh, you know, play tennis. I get good, good cardiac profile, blah, blah, blah. Um, and uh, despite my advanced years, I didn't I didn't really see any point to it. You know, my my cohort was not getting, uh, you know, dropping dead from COVID, nor getting much in the way of illness. Anyway, but at some point, because of travel, because of this and that, logistics, you know, society, lockdowns, forcing this and that, cards, you know, I want to take, anyway, I chose the J&J &J, um, because you possibly sacrificed some F F mild version of F efficacy, 10% or something like that, but you had something that was a, a, a safer, uh, more, at least more proven platform. And, and you know, there were other modalities of vaccine, the Sinovac and the Covaxin, uh, which are what I call like freeze-dried um, um, virus that uh, China, India, Russia had, and it was Sputnik and whatnot, um, that, you know, people took. And I, I don't think they necessarily had the same uh, side effect profile the mRNAs did. I don't know if you can speak to any of that. Um, uh, right, yeah. Um yeah, I, I, I mean, what, what, so I, I, right with the mRNA technology, is it could it potentially be could it potentially be good for, for cancer for, or whatever? I mean, potentially, but of course they've been trying to develop it for for decades and and struggling to get something that was safe uh, and effective. Uh, they're going to keep trying, and it'll be interesting what they come out come up with. But one of the problems is uh, one of the one of the outcomes of this pandemic has been more people, including myself now, are much more suspicious of the claims that pharmaceutical companies make about their drugs. You now, now I read a study, especially a, a trial, a trial results uh, from a from a run funded and run by a funded by and run by a, a pharmaceutical company. And I and I think, can I really trust this? Uh, is is when they say it's got efficacy, is that really how efficacy? how effective it is when they say it's this safe is that really how safe it is what have they <laughs> what how what how have they managed to get those those favorable figures uh which they're so desperate uh, to get in order to just in order to justify uh, the huge sums that they spend developing and trying trialing these <clears throat> these drugs so there is so there's there's that issue i think there's the question of, of to what extent do we think we can trust trust it but in principle sure you know there's uh, we, we all want there to be effective medicines that can that can help us and and in, and in principle something uh, with a genetic uh, a ge genetic basis uh, could uh, could help uh, i just i just hope that i don't have to be one of the first uh, so and in terms of the uh, in terms of the janssen uh, vaccine which is uh, similar to the oxford or astrazeneca uh, vaccine in uh, in this country so there are as you say an adenovirus vector uh, vaccine. It's, it's been really interesting with that to see how that's been denigrated uh, by uh, by the authorities, both 
uh, this side of the Atlantic in the EU and uh, and 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 in the UK uh, and and then also particularly in the States. I think with the in the in the UK, we resisted uh, that uh, uh, that denigrating of that vaccine uh, because it was produced. It was the Oxford vaccine, so it was we had a kind of patriotism about it. I think, and the EU <laughs> was, uh, was particularly negative about it. I think for the same reason because it was a UK vaccine, and they're still smarting over Brexit. So that might be explained uh, by by that. But the, but I think the really interesting case is the United States, where they where the 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 Johnson and Johnson vaccine. The CDC, the health authorities, were much more upfront about the health, the side right. effects, the health they, risks. They, they were not. I don't think it was a level playing field. No, no, exactly, not at all. Uh, there was, uh, they were much more upfront about the about there being deaths, the blood clots, of course, in particular, uh, the the problem of the VITT, the uh, the uh, the blood clotting uh, problem, uh, and really trying, and really, and really s suppressing that uh, vaccine quite quite soon. After, uh, afterwards, and this has been attributed, and I think rightly, to there being an uh, institutional preference uh, for the mRNA technology. Uh, the mRNA technology being the preferred technology of the global bodies, of the Gates-funded bodies, of the American, uh, of the NIH, and the, and the health, the health bodies. There, it was, it was, it was. They'd, they'd really been pushing and sponsoring and and developing mRNA technology in particular. And I don't know how welcome. The Johnson Johnson vaccine and this alternative technology really was to them. Uh, in any case, uh, the facts are that they have been they've been much more upfront. They, I, they, I think they still in America have still not acknowledged a single death from the mRNA vaccines, uh, which is insane considering how many were reported uh, to their adv adverse event uh, the, to theirs uh, adverse yeah, event. Yeah, Yeah, and um, uh, but they have with the with the adenovirus vaccines and have and have. Uh, recommend people don't don't use them uh, any <clears throat> any more uh, in favor of course of the mrna vaccines which are uh, continue supposedly to be entirely safe and entirely effective so uh, so that so that was that was an interesting uh, that was an interesting dynamic and i think showed again just showed a, another way that, that that agenda you can see that it's driven by an ag agendas uh, the, of the of what we you know we call the, the elites which is just a shorthand yeah. for the people with so, the power and the money I think situation. you and I can possibly agree that uh, Andrew Bridgen, uh, I'm not sure particularly his his background, but uh, he he's probably not of the elite uh, these days. He's been uh, expelled from the Conservative Party, uh, so he's a he's a party of one. Um, he he uh, has been fighting back against um, the COVID vaccine for children. Uh, has he been successful? Is there kind of popular pushback against? Um, this kind of meretricious, uh, you know, overplay of their hand. Uh, what do you think about um, uh, vaccines for this COVID vaccine for children? Now, I'm, I say this at the risk of getting deep, deep platform myself, speaking of platforms from, from YouTube. My, my Andrew Bridgen uh, uh, video from uh, about a week ago or so um, uh, caused a, a, a strike um, on my uh, YouTube channel and was was quickly you know it just disappeared by them um i i, I just as a slight, slight preface i had uh, retza uh, levy a professor at mit on my show almost a year ago today and his uh you know ground you know i i it's not it wasn't a revolutionary claim he was pointing out that that children never really got sick from covid um that whatever whatever risk there happens to be and he's not claiming any particular one but but where there's some risk with anything um, uh, whatever risk there was from the vaccine was greater than the risk from the illness itself for children, and children should not get the COVID vaccine. That that destroyed my erstwhile YouTube channel entire. So I had, a, you know, I'm not sure how many thousands of subscribers I had, but that just disappeared. I have not been able to recreate that one. Um, mm, yeah, that, yeah. But, you, but is is that going on in England? Was was uh, you know was uh, MP Bridgen's um, effort? Successful. Uh, what, what are what are attitudes towards these repeated uh, COVID vaccines? Is it going to be placed on the the general ledger um, for children? You know, five, ten years from now, that they have to get a COVID vaccine. Uh, is it happening in the EU? Is it happening um, in the UK? Is it happening? Oh, right. in the UK? Yeah, yeah. Because in in the states, the um, it's it's on the chartered schedule, isn't it? Is that right? I believe. Um, yeah, incredible. Yeah, no, that 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 kind of thing hasn't really 
hasn't really happened so much here. The, the they've, they've backed off. We're not quite so vaccine fanatical. Our, our health authorities here. I mean, we are a bit, but but I think not not so much. Not like the CDC and the um, the federal <coughs> authorities in America, which seem to be completely captured by the vaccine, um, the vaccine agenda and in industry. Um, so um, I, I don't. So I, I don't believe that that children's vaccine, COVID vaccines for children are um, uh, are recommended, uh, and certainly not not mandated for. Uh, for children, the, the the vaccines for children are very controversial here. The the JCVI, which was the uh, the the official advisory body for the government on whether the vaccines were safe, <clears throat> specifically uh, when when asked uh, back in uh, 2021, refused to endorse uh, the vaccines for children. They were not convinced uh, by them, and very controversially, the government uh, and the the government's chief medical officer overruled uh, their advisory body in order to authorize. Uh, the, the the vaccines for children, so they were allowed to have them, uh, but it was uh, it was it was very controversial uh, here, and uh, and and really, vaccines for children had a very low take up and uh, didn't and didn't really the COVID vaccines didn't really uh, didn't really take off. Um, All right, so uh, I, actually, I'm going to um, segue to make the best use of our time because I I have a couple other uh, looming questions for uh, Will Jones, PhD, uh, Daily Skeptic editor. Now, you, you've been uh, very um, uh, knowledgeable and authoritative about some of the lab leak um, foundations. Uh, I, I'm wondering if you would care to discuss um, some aspects of that. And, um, and potentially also we could possibly segue uh, into the, the question amongst some of the skeptics of whether there was a pandemic. You know, I, 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 we'd have to kind of categorize what that question means. but. Um, perhaps if you can take us into the world of, of Wuhan, EcoHealth, uh, Ralph Barrick, uh, Zheng, Zheng Li Zhi, Xi, um, and so forth. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that'd be good. Um, I, I just want to say on the last topic before we move on, just to answer the question that Andrew Bridgen, I think, uh, has been very much shunned, but has increasingly been gaining traction. His, he keeps having debates in Parliament. And uh, the debate, I think it was last week, uh, was the best attended so far with MPs <coughs> and peers. Um, so it, it, the, 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 he is having some success and getting getting more traction than than he had before, although it's still very very slow going. So I just wanted to say that. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, so, so good on him for keeping pushing that, uh, keeping pushing that uh, agenda in Parliament. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, la lab leak, lab origin. So yeah, there's there's been lots of rev revelations um, around that recently, hasn't there? We keep hearing keep ha having emails uh, coming being leaked out. Uh, from the time, keep getting little dribs and drabs. Uh, more the uh, the teams, the guys at Public, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you know Michael Schellenberger and and the um, and oh, what was the other one? Anyway, the uh, the other the other one that's associated with that have been uh, have been have been getting some good scoops uh, on that. I think I have to say that it's pretty clear. Oh, it's it's it's, yeah, it's very clear that the virus was engineered. Uh, that more evidence keeps coming out on that. We've had a new uh, the first people who saw it, you can actually see the very first people who saw it, uh, who first identified it in China uh, in the last week of 2019, their first thought was, uh, has this come out of a lab? Um, so it was the very first thought of the very first person who identified it in the last week of China. And then it was the first thought of Robert Redfield, he said, the CDC director, when he first heard about it on the 1st of January. It was the first thought, she Zheng Li said, of the, world, of the WIV. She said that it was her first thought, did it come out of my lab? And she claims that she went and checked. <clears throat> and she claims that it didn't um, come out of her lab. Um, but, um, but then she published a paper in mid-January uh, publishing uh, the the rat G13, the closest uh, the closest sample from her lab, and saying we have the sample. This is the closest sample. It's ninety six percent similar, but this virus did not evolve naturally from this sample, uh, and left open uh, the question of where it did uh, come from. Uh, so and so is the first thought, and then we've had uh, uh, and then we've had more revelations on that uh, just in in, rec in recent weeks. Um, we've had uh, this uh, this new new details from the earlier drafts of the 2018 diffuse uh, proposal. I don't know if your listeners are familiar with that. This is a very key piece of of information. It was a year before the pandemic. A proposal that was written by Ralph Barrick uh, of uh, University of North Carolina uh, and in conjunction with um, 
it was a collaboration with the WIV, but it was definitely being driven by him and his team uh, in the States uh, to uh, to uh, take a uh, to take a, bat, uh, a, a, cor a coronavirus and insert into it uh, a spike protein with a furin cleavage site uh, very much like well, almost identical to uh, to SARS uh, SARS CoV two. So essentially, it was a proposal to create, if you like, SARS SARS CoV two. We've known about that for some time, but recent weeks, earlier earlier drafts have come out. Some more information about that, and it's become and so that and the underlying structure of the of how they put it together in six pieces. Uh, Alex Washburn has been doing some amazing work uh, on that. Um, as, as six uh, that they they. They've identified that it was going to be put together in six pieces, and this confirms earlier work that Alex had done, uh, where he had uh, he had identified what appeared to be the six pieces of the of SARS-CoV-2 uh, with uh, with the virus, um, uh, six pieces uh, in, the, in the virus. So, uh, so he's so th there's this revelation. So I think it's just becoming clearer and clearer um, all the time uh, that. Uh, 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 if, if it wasn't clear already that uh, that the virus uh, was made in a lab, uh, and but the, crucially with these revelations is is it's become clear, becoming clear that, or at least it's looking more and more like that the the, the lab that must have been intrinsically des intrinsically involved in designing that uh, and, and in doing the underlying technical work for it must have been Ralph Barrick's. Uh, lab uh, in uh, in the UNC uh, University of North Carolina because uh, because uh, because basically uh, the virologists uh, are all all or all basic are all agreed that uh, that uh, that his is the only his is the only lab and he's the only person his team uh, are the only ones with the technical expertise to have done uh, that work uh, to actually design it and and uh, and to design it and uh, put, i was going to say create it but actually it's it could be having that having had the design work done in principle the actual putting it together uh, could be uh, could be done uh, uh, somewhere else uh, so uh, so it's not de determinative of where it was actually being worked on uh, but it's been it's become increasingly clear and it's been, and even more so in the last week uh, that, uh, that 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 this american lab this american team ralph barrett um, and co uh, must be intrinsically involved um, with with uh, the, the creation of this um, of this virus. That obviously leaves big questions of how it ended up uh, causing a, for its first outbreak in Wuhan, uh, in a city uh, in the middle of China. Um, if it's if you've got this this uh, this close involvement of this American American team, um, and that and that and there's there's all kinds of scenarios uh, that could have that could have produced. Uh, that could have ended up with that happening. Uh, big, big, big questions around that. But I think the important thing is that everyone is really, really, been, in terms of the lab leak, has been really, really focused on the on the on the Wuhan lab and what's going on with the Chinese team, and and we've seen that especially with with the output that's been coming out from the from the Senate um, and from a guy called Robert Cadleck, uh, who's who's one of the main intelligence linked uh, people who's been really pushing the lab leak. Uh, theory from early on. He wrote uh, the Muddy Waters report for the for the Senate uh, the Senate committee, um, uh, which which really pushed uh, the, the lab leak. That was that was um, I think uh, <coughs> so just over a year ago. Uh, so so really pushing that, and, and, and all the attention from him and from the Republicans uh, uh, and the, and those in, in the Senate has really been uh, on 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 China, and it's been and it's been part of the. Of the, the China is evil agenda, which I'm not. I have no no desire or wish to defend China uh, by any means. Uh, but, but the point is that it is tied up with that agenda, uh, and so there hasn't been so much focus on actually what role. Uh, and people talk about the, the Americans funding. There's, there's been an emphasis on Fauci funding uh, the, the the work in, in China and Wuhan, uh, and that is absolutely absolutely true. And that is uh, that needs to be properly uh, examined. Uh, but, but but actually. The role of the of, of, of Ralph Barrick and the American scientists and virologists in actually designing uh, and creating uh, the virus um, has been totally neglected, um, and yet we know that the uh, that the World Health Organization's own uh, no, sorry, the World Health Organization, the Lancet's commission looking at the origin of the virus, which was uh, which was headed up by um, oh, what's his name, Jeffrey? Do you remember his name? Uh, Jeffrey, 
uh, names gone my head. The Economist. Uh, anyway, he was leading the uh, he was leading the 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 Lancet's investigation into it, and he he disbanded the he disbanded his the investigation and 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 said that there was no point in doing it because he said that the American the American scientists. Uh, were not cooperating. He said they were not cooperating with the investigation, uh, and so there was no point in doing it. But he knew they were hiding something. So there, so there is something. So we don't know exactly what happened. We don't know how it was created, and we don't know how it ended up in Wuhan. Uh, but it is, it is, it is very clear uh, now uh, that we mustn't only be looking at the role of uh, the WIV Wuhan in Wuhan and Xi Zengli. Uh, but we also need to be looking at the role <coughs> that the um, that the American scientists played as well. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I, I've been in the background as you speak, and I, I thank you so much for speaking authoritatively. Um, I've had uh, Jim Haslam's article, and I also posted my own from Brownstone. Uh, I, mine is uh, <coughs> Eco Health Alliance's Wuhan Dalliances, um, and there have been a fair number. Um, you know, I, I had on uh, uh, Andrew Huff, PhD, um, about uh, a few months ago, three or four months ago. Um, and he worked with EcoHealth Alliance uh, back in the day, uh, around 2015 through 17 or so. And uh, you know, his his theory is that it was uh, spy versus spy. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw the uh, uh, Pro Prohias uh, cartoon uh, book uh, by that same name, Spy versus Spy. It's fascinating. He was an ex-Cuban. He uh, wrote for Mad Magazine and so forth and published these books. But you know, it's all spy work. You know, the spy, you know, every, they're, they're doing these things, you know, to counter each other. And at the same time, the one acknowledges the other one's countering that. So it's kind of this uh, multi-layered uh, jewel box of, of, of intrigue and, and confusion. And so the concept uh, Huff has is that um, Eco Health Alliance was basically a CIA um, cutout that we could watch what's going on in Wuhan. They were going to be doing this stuff anyway. Um, and we might as well have uh, feet on the ground, eyes um, you know, on the prize, so we'll be able to see what they're doing there. Whereas the Chinese uh, essentially knew this, but wanted to co-opt our greater technological sense and sensibilities and abilities um, to to watch Eco Health Alliance and nurture them to do their own, you know, bioweapon-ish uh, kind of things. Um, and of course, it's it's hard to prove that kind of thing. But um, I just put that out there. Um, the, I, I think that you know the, the with Watergate, uh, famously, you know, it was always not the crime, it was the cover-up that was the bad thing. Um, I, I, before we segue to the concept of, of whether there was a pandemic, um, I'm just curious, what, what is the level of the cover-ups being exposed, uh, both in the UK, globally, and or the US? Uh, so so, it, so we, we had the cover-up. So the most obvious cover-up was the, the Fauci-led, um, and actually Barrick and Peter Daszak for the Oka Health Alliance were involved in that as well. <clears throat> At the end of January 2020, beginning of February, that, that, that famous uh, cover-up of the lab origin uh, uh, and pushing, uh, a very effective for a year or so, pushing of the, of the zoonotic, uh, the, of the animal, the wet market theory, the animal spillover theory mm -hmm. of the origin. So there was, there was a real push uh, to, to do that, and there's and, and there's still people, the Zunati, as we call them, who are who are really pushing, uh, who are really pushing that that attempt to cover to, to cover it up. But there was a real concerted effort there to cover to cover up uh, the, the, the 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 obvious uh, lab uh, lab origin um, of it. Uh, there's also, I think, there's a cover up of early spread. Um, there's been no, there's been especially in America, a very very few studies uh, to look into. Uh, to what extent SARS-CoV-2 was was circulating um, in the later months of 2019, or even earlier? Um, I don't think it was around very much earlier, but uh, but there's been no, uh, but certainly in the end, in the second half of 2019, uh, no, no wastewater studies, uh, no uh, there was one red blood, one Red Cross uh, blood antibody uh, study, uh, but no, no follow up. Uh, nothing looking at bank samples, so so that, that it does feel like, uh, and that's of course part of the, the that's of course part of the the lockdown, the the COVID lockdown agenda, uh, where the where if if the if the if the virus was circulating uh, globally or in the US uh, during the end for months during the over that winter and the, over that autumn and winter, uh, then the whole idea of locking down to stop it from coming in and that, that whole narrative of, oh, it's coming over from China, we must lock down before it gets here, etc., uh, is obviously total nonsense. So there is there is a feeling that there's that they're, that they're, 
that the CDC and the and the authorities in America don't want to know and are suppressing uh, any any attempt to look into uh, early early spread. Um, and and of course there's there's suppression there's this obvious suppression of of problems with the vaccines and and in particular um, um, in addition to that yeah and as part of that a a uh, any link that they might have with the ex- with the extraordinary levels of excess deaths we've been experiencing since the rollout uh, they just won't release they won't release the the record level data uh, for uh, impartial researchers to have a look uh, to what extent the excess deaths are concentrated in the vaccinated after several years um, of this happening so it were two and a half years I think into into uh, into seeing these excess deaths um, these non-covid excess deaths and we still ha- have don't have uh, data to be able to properly compare uh, to, to be able to look at whether to what extent it's affecting vaccinated more than unvaccinated so uh, yeah, so it's a real, uh, I'm sure there's more as well, but they're, they're pretty obvious uh, areas where there's been been um, this kind of suppression uh, in line with the narrative. So, you know, amongst the, uh, you know, our team, as it were, of lockdown skeptics, uh, there's currently the concept that there was no pandemic. Uh, are you Have you followed this particular uh, line of thought and... Um, can you tell us what definitely is, is meant, intended by that crowd? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so th- they mean various different things. Um, the uh, the most the, the most obvious problem with the term pandemic is that the pandemic was, and, and this is in a way the most mainstream version of that claim, is that the term pandemic was redef- was famously infamously re- redefined by the World Health Organization in 2009 in order to make swine flu qualify as a pandemic, they removed the the requirement for it to cause a lot of deaths. Uh, So a pandemic no longer has to be deadly, uh, which obviously makes a bit of a mockery um, of the whole of the whole idea of a pandemic, because why why do why are we worried about a so-called pandemic if it's not killing anyone? Uh, But that was uh, that was the big that was that was the big change. Then uh, COVID, of course, is claimed to have killed uh, lots of uh, millions of uh, millions of people. Um, so, uh, so, so, so there, is, so there is a question of to what, what what counts as a pandemic. I mean, at the moment, a pandemic there's this definition, but it changes. A pandemic is basically whatever the World Health Organization says it is. Um, and so, I think part of the part of the worry is just this uh, this whole concept of a pandemic. Is 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 just part of the fear narrative because as soon as you have a pandemic, that's precisely when you can justify having ex- having an emergency, having extreme measures, having mandates, uh, coercion, uh, restrictions, all the all the stuff that we've had. They all tied up with this concept that there was this thing called a pandemic, uh, rather than just you know. Uh, a respiratory virus that may be slightly worse than the normal respiratory viruses, but mm-hmm. basically does the same thing uh, that all respiratory viruses do, which is have waves that are largely concentrated in the winter, right? So, um, so I think so. I think they're they're the, they're the they're the most. I think they're probably the most mainstream and and in my view defensible uh, versions of the there was no pandemic uh, pandemic. And to some extent, I would sign up to uh, to both of those uh, concerns about the concept of a pandemic. Although I do use the term myself because it's a very handy uh, term for describing what we're what we're talking about um, in, terms of, in terms of COVID. Um, but uh, th- there are other there are other stronger versions uh, which I'm more uncomfortable with. Uh, which uh, would so there's so obviously at one extreme there's the the virus deniers who think the viruses uh, don't exist, although they're very marginal. Uh, thank goodness. Uh, but the, but the more mainstream version, or it's not really mainstream, but 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 less marginal, I should say. Is the um, is the idea that although there was a virus uh, of some kind, uh, it wasn't really novel. Uh, so they're kind of they're pretty they're pretty uh, ambivalent about whether it was an engineered virus with a fewer and cleaner site that made it more uh, more infectious or more prone to uh, infect more of the more organs of the body, which is uh, which is what is believed to be the case with the fewer and cleaner site and the um, with SARS-CoV-2, um, but they, they, they deny, uh, so this is people uh, uh, like uh, the people from Panda, um, uh, which is an organization, a uh, skeptical organization, uh, that they, they, they tend to deny uh, that uh, there is a novel uh, virus that was unusually deadly. Uh, there was some kind of virus probably, but what they would say um, is, that, is that the excess deaths own, they would claim. I don't think it's entirely. I don't think it's entirely true. But they would claim that excess deaths only started 
uh, and only occurred where there were restrictions and that there was and that all the excess deaths uh, were were a were a, were a result of not of the virus as such uh, but of the response to it um, and of the way that people were treated in hospitals and care homes and the way that um, and then and then later on of the the vaccines uh, so uh, so that's the that's the kind of the so that 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 builds on of course the the point that these that these interventions uh, were uh, did result in some people dying that they were they were deadly uh, and <clears throat> that uh, the treatments of covid uh, were were uh, were often uh, non-ideal and in some cases very faulty. Uh, lots of concern, of course, about ventilators uh, and overventilation uh, early on. Uh, so, so we've got all, all those ideas. But building on that and really taking it to quite um, uh, an ex to, to, to an extreme point, really, um, that which is to to say that actually uh, the, the virus itself uh, didn't uh, wasn't really responsible for. Uh, for for more deaths than normal so that that would be the the, the claim i think and uh, and the main point that they point to uh the main the main thing they point to to back this up is they say well if it was circulating the virus was circulating since what um november at least uh 2019 it was there november december january february uh circulating globally there's there's quite a bit of evidence of that uh but we didn't see any spikes of death or no excess deaths you know it was all that the, the virus was around and then all of a sudden uh, we get to uh, March uh, 2020, everyone locks down and everyone has deaths, uh, excess deaths, big waves of deaths. Um, and so and so their argument is uh, that uh, that, well, and that, you know, the, the correlation isn't with the presence of the virus, it's with the presence of the of the response. So QED uh, is the response that um, uh, that did it. I think that's really good. Uh, I think there's really good reasons to think that the, the virus uh, was uh, was behind the deaths, for example, the um, a, very um very thorough autopsy uh report from germany of um hundreds of of autopsies of covid patients from the first wave uh found that uh 86 percent of of covid deaths in the hospitals in germany they just took they just took all the ones that were that had their autopsies uh were a result of uh, the virus uh, killing them it was they showed clear signs of being killed by the virus 50 or just over 50 percent of them uh clear clearly a viral pneumonia that had killed them, and then a further 30%, and a further uh, third uh, being um, multi-organ failure um, subsequent to uh, a viral, uh, viral, the viral pneumonia and viral virus um, infection. Uh, with and then around 14% uh, uh, or 16% uh, being um, being misclassified, so not actually a COVID death. Uh, and I, I'm I'm inclined to accept that evidence and the fact. That it seems that there really was, for whatever reason, big viral surges in the in the March 2020. You can see that in various in various data. For whatever reason, the virus didn't surge in most places during that winter, even though it was around. It only surged. Maybe it was because they had mutations and new variants that took root. We don't entirely fully understand viruses and why they surge at certain times and and why they become dominant um, at certain times and aren't there and aren't at others, even though they're there. So, um, so I, I just see that as one of the one of the things that we don't fully understand, but there's clear evidence there were surges of the virus uh, in the March 2020, and then there's clear evidence from things like autopsies uh, that uh, uh, that it really was the virus uh, killing uh, most of the people. Um, mm -hmm. That's not obviously to take away from the the fact that, that there were a lot of deaths uh, caused by other uh, other factors and mistreatment uh, and faulty treatment and all of that and all of that kind of thing. So, so that would that would be, that would be my view and that would be my take on the on the debate really. Yeah, um, there is a, um, a very long open letter to Will Jones of the Daily Skeptic um, uh, by Jessica Hockett, whom I've had on the, the show, um, and here it is, very long letter uh, regarding ventilator and iatrogenic deaths in New York City. And she was on with um, Jonathan Engler of the UK. And um, I'm, I'm wondering, did you ever get to see her very long letter? And uh, I maybe your response has already been implicit in what you've said. But do you have anything particular to uh, discuss uh, regarding her letter? Um, yeah, I did. I did. I did read that. Yeah, so it was uh, flattering to get a very long, long letter from Jessica. Uh, I think she was responding to my um, to my article I'd written about. I looked at the data for New York City and found I can't remember the the, the fact these the statistics on my head. But basically, um, the if you looked at the proportion 
of people who were on a ventilator in in the people the, the proportion of people who died uh, with COVID in New York on a ventilator um, wasn't was was only about a fifth, I believe, of the total number who died. And so my point was that that even if you do, and I do think they did overventilate in in um, overuse ventilators in New York. Um, but 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 even so, even if the ventilators killed every single person uh, who was put on them, and actually it was close to that, it was, it was something like ninety-seven percent. It would still only account for around uh, for a minority. For I think it was, I think it was around a fifth, but I, I haven't looked that recently um, of um, of the of the COVID deaths in New York, and so it couldn't be. So the ventilators couldn't be the 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 the, 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 exp the explanation for why for that for that extraordinary death event in. Um, in New York, and in fact, a more recent article from Jessica um, and her, her colleagues on that actually tacitly admitted uh, um, a number of my points, and uh, and they basically said um, actually it doesn't correlate with the interventions either. And they started saying that actually we think there may be something wrong with the data. Uh, was their more recent article um, because because it doesn't make it doesn't make sense, and I, th I kind of saw that as tacitly accepting um, perhaps some of the, the, the points that I've made because they were now saying actually we think there needs to be another explanation. So well, thank you so much. I very much appreciate your time. Um, love to have you back on sometime. I think you're a, a great uh, uh, discourser and uh, knowledge based uh, uh, source for us, and I appreciate your work. Thank you. It's been a been a pleasure to come on. Thank